Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 172nd scale USS Sculpin SSN 590 Fast Attack Submarine. The model that we have here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, as I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. However, those building services are only offered for tanks and other armored fighting vehicles. This being a 172nd scale submarine is obviously outside of that window. However, if anyone is interested in contacting me about the other subject matters that I do work in, I can be reached by the following email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. If anyone is new to this channel or stumbling upon my submarine videos for the first time, this one here is not the first 172nd scale skipjack class submarine model that I've done a build review on. I've already done about four other ones and those can all be found on the channel. Just like with those examples, this one here was built with the same 172nd scale Mobius USS Skipjack fast attack submarine kit. This one here has had several modifications and aftermarket parts added to it to enhance it from the stock kit configuration. We'll be going over these additions as well as just the other aspects of this build in this video. To start this video off, let's take a quick walk around this model. And this vessel here is the USS Sculpin SSN 590. The Sculpin was one of the six of the Skipjack class fast attack submarines that were developed by the US Navy in the 1950s time frame. As I touched upon in other Skipjack class fast attack sub videos, the Skipjack class was a very influential submarine design that was designed in the post-war years by the U.S. Navy. It was the merger of two technologies. The first was the nuclear power plant, which was pioneered on by the Nautilus, and the second was the teardrop-shaped hull that was pioneered by the USS Albacore. By fusing these two technologies together, the U.S. Navy for the first time had a submarine that was optimized for underwater propulsion and had terrific handling and underwater performance while having the advantages of the nuclear power plant which meant that this submarine was a leg up from previous subclasses and also was a leg up compared to what the Soviet Union was designing at the same time. This submarine design would be the template on how the Navy would build their nuclear powered submarines from this point onward. And basically even up till today, you take a look at the current Virginia class or the other proposed boats that are on the drawing board, and they still utilize the exact same design concepts that were pioneered back in the 1950s by the USS Skipjack class family. The Sculpin was laid down on the 3rd of February of 1958 at the Ingalls Shipbuilding Plant in Mississippi. The vessel was completed and commissioned into the U.S. Navy on the 1st of June 1961. The vessel served with the United States Navy all the way up until 1990. The name USS Sculpin was actually chosen in honor of another boat of the exact same name that saw service during World War II. Obviously, that earlier iteration was a diesel electric boat, but sadly, that was one of the 52 boats that were lost during the war and it was sunk by the Japanese. Throughout the USS Sculpin service life, it saw extensive deployments on both the Atlantic and Pacific theaters, and by the time the vessel was eventually retired in the 1990s, it saw its fair share of the Earth's surface, from operating in the waters around Asia to operating into the Mediterranean Sea region. Throughout this time, the vessel was continuously updated and upgraded with various refits in order to keep the vessel up to date with other technologies that were being fitted to the other U.S. submarines of this period. This went on all the way up until the submarine was eventually retired and decommissioned. Eventually, the submarine spent its last days at the Puget Sound shipyard along with many of its other sister ships and other submarines that were also nuclear powered. Eventually the submarine was scrapped and only a little chunk of the hull remains today housing the nuclear reactor awaiting for further recycling. At this point in my videos I would go ahead and say let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started to get a good idea on what the base art kit supplies you with and I do a thorough inbox review and a background of the kit's history and all that. However since I've already done at this point four of these models 
that information is really more or less redundant and that info is talked to in great lengths in those other videos. In fact, I'll have the links to both of those with the timestamps in the video description below. But in a nutshell, this model here started off as a 172nd scale full plastic USS Skipjack kit from the company Mobius. The Mobius Skipjack kit has been in production now for a little over 10 years and because of that a large number of them have been produced. And these kits are really easily come by and when found are relatively affordable. These models are some of the more affordable 172nd scale submarine kits on the market and when found can be had for anywhere between 90 to about 110 some odd US dollars. This particular kit here I purchased off of Amazon.com, but purchase isn't exactly the right word because I got the model for free due to some saved up credit card points. But regardless, these models at the point of filming this video are fairly prolific and because of that are also relatively affordable. The kits are comprised primarily from standard injection molded polystyrene pieces and the kit also supplies you with a fret made of clear plastic bits, which would include details like the windows as well as the rear sail beacon light. And you'll also, most importantly, get a fret of photo etch that are used for some of the valve covers that are found on the rear portion of the vessel. We will be going over this as the video goes on, so stay tuned for that. The models are fairly simplistic in the overall detailing which is found on the surface, but this is more or less true to form to the actual subject matter. Nuclear subs aren't exactly well known for their vast amount of appendages, so the kit is actually really well suited for that role. However, there are several areas that the kit can be improved with the addition of some aftermarket components, which this model does have, and I will be touching upon that as the video goes on as well. The real work that's involved with building one of these models is really more or less a example in bodywork. With the way the model is designed, it has several sub-assemblies for the hull as well as the sail. The hull itself is subdivided into four sections, and because of that, you have several units to plug and fit together. Around all of these locations, seam work will be present, so you will have to do a bit of seam removal with various modeling techniques in order to polish it up to the configuration that you have here. As I just mentioned, the seam removal is really the largest amount of work that's required to just get the model fully assembled. And if anyone's curious on how to go about with the seam removal, again, I have a timestamp in the video description listed below that has exactly what techniques I personally use on my skipjack builds. And you can see that from start all the way to the finished end result. And that's really all there is to it to the kit's background and this leads us to the actual model itself. With the camera brought in closer, we'll start with the hull and specifically with the bodywork. Well, actually to be really specific, you shouldn't see any of the bodywork and it should be a seamless appearance and that's basically the point. If the bodywork is done properly, it should leave for a nice seamless appearance like you see on this model over here. Like I touched upon before, the hull itself is subdivided into four sections. We have two sections for the upper portion of the hull and two portions for the lower portion of the hull and then both sections combine together which will leave for a nice seam line running across the entire center portion of the vessel. On this model here the fit of the components was excellent and they went together very very well and required less body work to go ahead and complete to the final form. This is something that I do want to mention because on a couple of the earlier versions of this kit here that I've built in the past the hull sections had this weird quirk where they didn't really fit together all that well. Most likely had to do with the way they were packaged in the box and also with the shipping. Those models obviously they were still able to be fully assembled but did require a little bit more coercion by the builder in order to properly jig everything, let the fest or the uh, adhesive set and then that will allow you to continue with the remainder of the build. For this example and another previous example that I've built, that wasn't the case. The sections were the appropriate size out of the box, very little if any coercion was needed, and the section just went together without any problems, which of course is a nice happy feeling for all involved. Even though the sections went together without any issues, that still does not change the fact that some body work is still going to be needed because of, again, just the natural seam lines that are going to be present. The seam removal was done with the use of red putty and thick super glue, as I mentioned earlier, and then once everything was fully set, it was polished down repeatedly in a number of different waves in order to get the hull appearance with the smooth look that we have right here. The biggest challenge with the body work involves the rear section over here where we have the upper and lower 
rear plane sections where you have to carefully polish around these areas over here. With the way the geometry is, it's a little tricky, specifically since the tail fins need to be installed as the hulls are going together. And most importantly, the other area that needs to be really, really carefully built or addressed by the builder is with the bow nose area. Because of the torpedo tube sections, the seam will run right across these areas over here, and so this will add a little bit of complexity when it comes time for plugging up the holes and then polishing them down. It's not uncommon for the doors themselves to have a little bit of the seam removal material added to these sections over here, and then some careful re-sculpting is going to be needed by the builder in order to re-etch these sections out. Fortunately, this is again very easily done, but it is something that I do want to mention. The way I like to do is with a tip of a worn out airbrush needle, which will allow me to scribe in these sections, which will remove any sort of the super glue or putty that were in the areas, leaving for the nice clean etched surface that, you, that is present on this following build. It's also at this time on these videos that I want to mention the unsung hero, which is the stand. The stand that's found on the model here is not the original stand that's supplied with the Mobius kit. The stand that's supplied with the kit is this plug-on type stand, which is something that does hold the model very secure, admittedly. However, one thing I don't like about it is that there are two large holes that are molded into the bottom portion of the lower hull for the units to plug into. Some people may not have a problem with that. However, me personally, I don't like the way that stand method is incorporated specifically since now you have mo permanent modifications made to the hull. On the model over here those plug sections are amputated and are polished away with the bodywork with the same techniques that I mentioned earlier and a new stand was that made in place. The stand here is made from the same units that I touched upon in the other videos which it's actually a recast of the Ravel 172nd scale USS Gato stand which again I want to say is an excellent submarine stand and basically consists of this, or I should say these two sections here, which are resting copies of the Ravel one. And then I go ahead and add two PVC tubes to the two sections over here, which hold the unit together nice and securely. It's a simple stand, but most importantly, it cradles the skipjack absolutely perfectly. You may notice that I went ahead and added blue painter's tape to these two sections where the hull makes contact with the stand, and this is done just to prevent any sort of paint scraping or scratching to the hull itself where it makes contact in these areas. Some people tend to want to use a rubber type material for this, but you have to be careful because in some occasions the rubber can have a negative effect on the paint and actually wear it out. A Frost King or a pool noodle type sponge assembly can possibly be used and I have had some pretty good results with them in the past. In fact, more than likely I may upgrade the, all of the stands on these models as time goes on with this type of system, but this is something to mention in an upcoming video. Outside of the bodywork, everything else on the lower portion of the hull is as per the kit. Here you can see the two photo wedge components that I was touching upon before. They are bent to match the curvature of the side of the model and then just secure on in place with regular super glue. They install very, very easily, effortlessly, and once fitted in place, really give a nice little bit of detailing to the rear portion of the submarine. Another thing that I like to do is to drill out several of these vent holes that are integrally molded to the side of the model. It's a nice way to, again, add a little bit of extra detailing without having to do all that much real effort. All the way to the rear takes us to the propeller, and this is the kit propeller, and you can see it's been painted and weathered to match the remainder of the submarine's lower section weathering. On this build, I went with the earlier pattern of kit propeller as opposed to the Iron Bottom Sound 3D printed shark fin prop because for the era that this submarine is being represented in. This version of the Sculpin with this sort of color scheme on it would have originally had the five blade prop, or at least from that's what I was able to ascertain from several of the clues that I was looking at when I was researching this vessel. The kit prop is actually very nicely done. It goes together very well. It is a two-piece assembly, so there is a little bit of seam work to contend with in between the blades, but this is very easily polished away with a couple needle files and some thick super glue. The only real reason why I would ever swap out the kit supply prop would be if I was rendering a skipjack class submarine from the later service usage, whereby the mid to late 1960s, all six of the skipjack class submarines had these propellers replaced with the shark blade one in order to improve underwater performance and more importantly, to give the submarine a quiet noise signature compared to the earlier style propeller that we have here. The 
Other reason why anyone out there would want to change out the kit prop is if they are trying to radio control this model, and in that case, a metal prop would probably be a better fit. However, if you are going to swap out the prop, you want to be keeping in mind the weathering. A lot of individuals out there like to have a weathered submarine like this one here, but the propeller is nice and shiny brass. Obviously, this is something that's very anachronistic, and if you are going to swap out the prop, make sure that it blends in with the remainder of the weathering, much along the lines as you see it here. Of course, while on the rear section, I might as well mention the zinc plates, which are kit supplied. They are very nicely rendered with the way the kit is and just get installed without any problems. One thing that I do want to mention, though, and this is something I've learned from the other Skipjack class subs, is that when it comes time for fitting these pieces in place, the tolerance on the pegs and the matching holes are a bit on the snug side, specifically if you add these components after the model is fully painted, like I do for reasons that should be pretty clear. Obviously painting these components off the runner and then mounting them to the submarine after it's completed is an easier avenue as opposed to trying to paint these after everything is fully secured on the model. Well, if you're going to do this, this is obviously one that simplifies the painting and weathering quite a bit, but the holes tend to be a little bit on the snug side due to all the layers of paint buildup. One thing that I like to do is with a Dremel or with a pin vise or possibly a needle file, just to remove a little bit of material from those sections, which will allow the clearances for these pieces fully painted to be installed without any sort of extra coercion necessary. Also on this area over here, you can see the little manhole cover, and I did went ahead and add the little flush mounted fastener detailing, which is something that is going to be mentioned on a few other sections of this vessel, and it's something I like to do on all my skipjack models because it gives extra added detailing, and it would be present on the real unit. On the top fin over here, you can see the addition of the iron bottom sound rear taillight beacon. The original kit does have this bit of detailing integrally molded on. The geometry is okay, but it does leave some room for improvement. Also, on the kit one, it's actually made out of standard opaque plastic, while obviously the real lens would have been a clear dome. With the Iron Bottom Sound Skipjack accessory set, it supplies you with this piece, it is an HD 3D printed material piece, and because of that, it's naturally translucent, which once fully painted and installed to the model, gives some very nice added realism and extra detailing to the piece in comparison to the kit supplied one. Moving to the upper hull detailing, you get to see some of the extra added details that I designed and fitted to this model that are found on the Iron Bottom Sound accessory set, which further enhances it from the stock original unit. As I mentioned before, the Mobius Skipjack kit is a relatively simplistic kit in overall detailing, and there is really nothing wrong with that because the Mobius Skipjack really more or less resembles or has the appearance of what the Skipjack would look like during its underwater running. And this would be with all of the external appendages folded up. But one way to add some extra detailing to any nuclear submarine is to render it like I've done here with all of these fittings in the exposed state. And here we have starting with the rear tie down. The rear tie down is the Iron Bottom Sound HD 3D printed component. And here you can see what it looks like once fitted in place. The kit does have almost all of these locations integrally molded into the upper portion of the hull because again, it mimics them in the retracted state. So the panel lines are present. What's great about this is that this gives you exactly the correct locations where to fit on the corresponding details. And it does remove a lot of the guesswork. For the front and rear tie downs, you do need to remove that section of plastic that's molded in. But again, since the panel lines are present, it gives you the perfect outline to basically, lack of a better term, color within the lines. This is done with a Dremel and a needle file, and after a few passes, you'll have the right amount of material removed, and this will allow the insertion of the iron bond sound component. Moving forward takes us to a similar detail in terms of its installation, and that would be the detailing for the escape trunk hatch that's found on the rear and there's another matching one found on the front. This is another iron bottom sound component and it's supplied with this set. This set here gives you the added detailing of the hatch and it definitely improves it over the stock one that is just a simple plate found in this area over here that doesn't have the detailing which is present on this unit. This would include the little inlet as well as that little hook that's present right here on the center portion of the hatch. The way this unit is installed, of course, is you amputate the original one, and this unit gets installed from underneath. The piece does have a little plate integrally printed to the bottom, so it self-levels. Basically, once the appropriate material is removed, you just glue this unit from underneath. It 
goes into its appropriate location and it bounces out without having the builder need to self level or adjust the unit to make sure it's nice and straight. Just drops right in and within a few seconds, the installation is completed. While on this area over here, I do want to point out the little four hooks that are present in these areas. These I believe are for a rescue bell to be fastened in place in case there's an emergency the crew can board onto this unit and then be hoisted back up to safety. Well this little bit of detailing is present on the Mobius kit but like I often mention the details themselves are not included. The little hole indications are present for where the hooks got to go and they are to scale however the hooks themselves are not found with the model. Real simple thing to correct all you got to do is drill out these areas here with a small pin vise and then fabricate brand new half round hooks out of some thin floor wire. Once bent to shape they get inserted into these four locations and a matching four on the front and you're good to go and the model now is more detailed because of that. With the hatch out of the way you can see the remaining details such as the flush mounted fastener holes present on all of these little hatches found in this area on the rear. Again done with a pin vise just a small little shallow divot drilled in and then you're good to go. Here you get to see the rear roller as well as the other tie downs again in their deployed state. On the roller itself with some silver paint I went ahead and added it to these middle sections because obviously this is where the rope would be constantly spooled up and paint would wear off on these locations quite quickly and quite frequently. So by adding a little swipe of silver paint there it, it does give you a little bit more added realism. While on the topic of added details you can see the small little eyelet added to the center portion here of the escape buoy. This again is a bit of detailing that is present on the real example but is omitted on the Mobius kit. Fortunately it's really easy to fabricate with a small little dremel bit, a pin vise, and a little bit of floor wire. Not to mention a small little plier just to bend it to shape. While on that note I want to mention that the exact same detailing is also present on the marker buoy that's found on the front bow section of the submarine which you'll be seeing momentarily. Moving forward still takes us to the very iconic rear bit of detailing found on the extended portion of the skipjack sail. On the real vessel this is actually a shroud and a cover for the induction and the exhaust manifold for the diesel engine. Of course the skipjack is a nuclear powered submarine but that does not mean it doesn't have a backup diesel engine on board. Well just like with any submarine with a diesel power plant it needs an exhaust and a air induction present in order to keep the thing running. And on the skipjack it's concealed with this very iconic piece found on the rear portion of the sail. Of course this is stock with the kit but where the modifications come in is with the side portions that we have here. With the way the stock Mobius kit is this section is cut out and you can see some ribs present in place. It's actually a nicely detailed be, uh, bit of equipment. However because of the way the sculpin was in this configuration this area here was plated over and resembles the format you see on this model. If you are building the sculpin for an earlier rendition like for instance when it was just launched it would have the stock tower format and you just build it in that type of configuration. If however you're going to model the sculpin in this type of configuration that slit needs to go and in order to remove it a thin strip of plastruct that has the exact same width of the gap that's present on the Mobius sail was found. I simply just trimmed it, glued it to the side sections and then just polished everything over with the bodywork with the same procedures that I mentioned on the hull earlier. Once done it will give you the later configuration that is present on this model. Pivoting our way to the top portion of the cover you can see the limber holes present in this section over here. Obviously this is done to vent out any sort of trapped in air as the submarine submerges. Well the holes are in a certain format and do need to be drilled out. Fortunately the Mobius kit has all of these pieces as indentations found on the rear portion here and the only thing the builder needs to do is to just drill them out with a pin vise and a small dremel bit. After about a minute or so you should have all of these holes drilled out and it definitely adds to the realism and overall detailing of the model. Briefly skipping past the sail takes to the bow of the model and here you get to see the remainder of the bow detailing. Obviously we have the cleats found in this section as well as the front roller. Again same details that I mentioned on the back. And here you get to see the front tie down point. Now unlike the tie down point on the rear the front one doesn't have any sort of 
marking or indication where this component needs to be fitted. But fortunately, there are lots of good reference materials out there on the internet, namely on navsource.org. The link is found in the video description. And from there, you can basically figure out exactly where this component gets fitted in place. In order to secure this on the submarine, obviously, just like with the rear, you need to carefully mark the section out, amputate the material, and then the unit just drops directly in where it needs to go. Hopping back to the sail takes to the sides and here you get to see all the side detailing present on this model. All of the axis panels are integrally molded into the side moldings of the sail and are nice and cleanly molded. However, one thing that's missing are again all the little flush mounted fastener holes that were added to this model over here. This again was done with the pin vise, a small dremel bit, and a little bit of patience. One thing that I do recommend is possibly with a pencil to mark the appropriate locations just so that you know exactly where to put the hole and it'll prevent any sort of mishaps on placement. Me, believe it or not, I don't really need to do that so much anymore because I've done so many of these subs, it kind of comes as second nature. But if you're doing this for the first time or if you're unsure of yourself, nothing beats playing it safe and using a pencil to carefully mark everything out. Also on this location over here, you get to see the rear sail indicator beacon. And this again is the kit supply part and it is made out of clear polystyrene. One thing that I do want to mention is that if you paint the inside portion of the clear plastic part before installation into the sail, you'll get this really cool effect that's very realistic where you don't really see the color on the sides. However, when you pivot the model to the rear, the piece will start glowing as it does actually on the real unit. Yellow paint was utilized because this is the color that I've seen more that more closely replicates the, the look of these beacons found on real boats. Also, while on the sail, you get to see the other bits of iron bottom sound fitting, such as the side nav lights. Just like with the cleats that I mentioned earlier, the side nav lights are designed to fold up on these submarines so that once folded up, it's less drag and the submarine can go faster on the water. But on the surface, they would hinge outward, giving you the look that you see here. The iron bottom sound components are again made out of HD 3D printed material. And because of that, you have excellent surface details molded in, but because of the the translucent nature. This allows the builder to have some good realism by painting the rear portion of the unit with the appropriate color. And then once installed in place, you get a nice amber glow to it that again mimics very closely the real counterpart. The iron bomb sound parts have all of the rib detailing and also column detailing, which would be present on the actual beacons. They are integrally printed on as one piece, so no assembly needs to be done, except for properly painting the component and then securing to the side of the sail. The pieces are, of course, painted red and green, depending on port or starboard. And you can see on this side, they are painted in red, or at least it should come out in my lighting. And on this side over here, the component is painted in green. On the very front portion of the sail, we have the two window sections. These are kit supplied, and with the way the kit is designed, it's basically impossible to mix up which one goes on the bottom and which one goes on top. The clear bits are installed with Elmer's white glue as a common trick that I frequently mention in these videos. If you use any sort of a permanent plastic melting type adhesive, like some sort of a model cement or even super glue, this can lead to some problems. Specifically, if you're installing in place, you may get a smudge on the window and obviously this can destroy the clear plastic nature of the window. Or if you're using super glue, it's gonna fog up on the inside there with that white gassy stuff and basically your windows are screwed at that point. With Elmer's white glue, that alleviates all those problems. It does secure the piece to the model pretty well. This is a static model, so it doesn't have to worry about it getting wet. But in case there's a mishap, you can just smear off the glue and you're good to go. And when it dries, it dries in a pretty transparent manner, leaving for a nice, clean installation. On the front portion here, you get to see the addition of the iron bottom sound siren, or that's what we call it on tanks. On these vessels, it would be the horn. <laughs> and the horn is a bit of detailing that just gets fitted in place and hopefully gets into focus. It just drops directly into the kit hole that's present on the model. The model just has a hole in this area over here with no other detailing present. So by just dropping the IBS piece in place, you get that detailing that is emitted. Also, you'll see that there's a little guard found in the front section over here. This is a bit of detailing that I typically add to all my skipjack models because it would be found on the real vessel. This is made on a thin piece of floor wire that's flattened with a hammer, cut the shape, and then just secured to this location right here. Once done, extra detailing is then added to the model. 
Of course, the sail is a two-piece assembly. Actually, it's a three-piece assembly, so you're going to have some seams to deal with on the, the entire length where the two halves meet on the front and also the aft. But on the top portion, it's just one teardrop-shaped item that drops in. So there's going to be another seam running along this portion over here. Again, very easily polished away, and once done, it leaves for some good results. The last bit of detailing to mention is the array, and the exposed array on a submarine model is just as important as exposed landing gear on an airplane. It gives you a lot of detail and a lot of focal points to your build. The array found on post-war and contemporary U.S. submarines is in the following format. All of the pieces of equipment are housed in these teardrop shaped shrouds, and the shrouds themselves have a certain paint scheme to them. The main base coat is a light primer gray of one flavor or another and then there's always some sort of a camouflage applied to it either in dots blotches or squiggles and to add even more variation you can have different types of applications some renditions these were sprayed on with a spray gun while i've seen other examples where they're just simply hand painted on with a brush either way will be acceptable and just depends on the builder's discretion and also if the builder has some good reference images of the exact version of the boat that they are building. For the model over here I went with the airbrushed or which would be on the real one a spray gun type blotch setup. The blotches are to me a panzer gray and the light gray or which would be a primer gray is actually my own mix that I made from to me a cur gray that I added some white to it to lighten it up giving it more of a primer equipment gray primer look like you see here. The top portions have been painted with the same color that I used for the remainder of the superstructure, which I'll touch upon momentarily. And while on this section here, I do want to, of course, mention the material of tubes for both of the periscopes. And as I've mentioned before, I've seen several real submarines where this is the case. On the attack scope, the periscope tube itself is a bright chrome type coloring. However, on the opposite scope here, it is more of a dark brown type silver coloring. For this example, the chrome color is just your standard off-the-shelf silver spray paint, while on this one here I took Vallejo silver, added a few drops of flat black to it, mixed it in, and that gives you the color change that you see present on this model. And the final bit of detailing on the array was saved for last since my favorite bit, and that is the snorkel induction detailing. Like I mentioned before, the snorkel induction is used for the diesel engine, and on the model over here, the stock unit was replaced with the iron bottom sound component. The IBS-1 just gets fitted onto the shroud once the original kit unit is amputated. The IBS one has far better detailing in comparison to the kit original and it gives you the added detailing of both the induction section as well as the exhaust section. The exhaust section is housed in this vented shroud and you can even see the hollow exhaust tube found in the center. On the induction portions they have their appropriate funnel detailing in a baffle type design and on the top portion you can see the indicator light present. The IBS set contains two patterns of lights, an early pattern and a late pattern of Grimes light. And again, they are made in the same HD 3D printed material, which leads for the same translucent effect that I touched upon on the other beacons. Once fitted in place, you can greatly see how much it improves the detailing over the stock original counterpart. And that's it for the detailing. And this brings us to the paint and the weathering. And for this model here, I went ahead and painted it very differently compared to some of the other Skipjack renditions that I did previously. For this one here, I was actually influenced by a couple real hidden images or video clips of the real USF Sculpin that were filmed of this vessel in the mid 1960s time frame. I actually have the links to both of the videos that show this exact vessel in this configuration in the video description but basically this one here is unique because it does not feature a red painted hull the hull on this one is actually flat black doesn't really look flat black once the weathering is added but this one is a dual tone where the lower portion of the waterline is all black but the waterline above is a dark or i should say a light bluish gray coloring and what made matters even more interesting was again from some of the real video clips of this vessel at this time was that the center spine portion here of the deck is painted in black as well. It gives for a very interesting looking vessel and once done it looks very different again compared to the other renditions of the Skipjack class that I've done previously. For the color again flat black spray paint El Cheapo brand from Home Depot was used to paint the entire vessel 
And then once that was done, I went ahead and masked it up in the following locations for the war line. And for the paint, I went with the same light German Panzer Grey color that I utilize on my 1-6 scale and other German Panzer Grey vehicles that are found on the ECA channel. Once that gray color is applied, I went ahead and peeled off the waterline. I masked this area up again, and I airbrushed the top deck sections with Tamiya Flat Black. Tamiya Flat Black was also used on the little camouflage section here on the tail. And that's basically it for the paint scheme. It's just a very interesting configuration once you have all the layers added in place. Then it came time for the weathering. For the weathering on this model here, I wanted to make it much more weathered compared to even my last example which was the USS Scorpion. Again this was influenced from the picture that or I should say the video clip of the USS Sculpin during this time frame in a dry dock and I'll even throw the picture up on the screen where you can see what the side hull looks like and it's just basically just white because it has so much salt type weathering effects added to it. On the model over here this is something that I actually didn't really anticipate. I haven't really weathered large panels like that in this configuration before so when I was applying the the weathering I first tried using the airbrush with some flat white and I ran into some problems with it but then I went ahead and dug up a very old technique that I haven't incorporated on any build in about you know 15 maybe 20 some odd years and that's the use of a wipe basically once the color was applied via the the airbrush I took a rag with denatured alcohol on it and I went ahead and smeared it remember the white paint is exterior latex so it's very susceptible to the denatured alcohol once the wipe went on, it actually did a really good job with doing this very interesting weathering effect that really can't be done in any other way. However, once the paint was all wiped down, I went ahead and continued adding some more effects with flat white and also a cream color with the techniques of both dry brushing, airbrushing, and then even more dry brushing on top of it, giving you the layered effect that's present on this model. Once the salty effects were completed, I then turned my attention to the biofouling. And this submarine here has more biofouling compared to, again, the other examples. For the biofouling, you'll see a mix of about three or four shades of green. And fortunately, with the usual subject matter that I work in, i.e. tanks and military vehicles, I have quite a few different shades of green, which all came in handy for this example here. The green is applied in a layered gradient type effect and this is done on purpose algae will be greener closer to the waterline because this area here is closer to the sun and receives more sunlight thus the algae has more chlorophyll and it's greener the more deeper you go less sunshine gets these areas over here and so the algae tends to be a darker green and more of a brown type coloring much along the way you see it on this example of my model the green gradient was done again via the airbrush however the top portion green over here was done with the dry brush giving you the carpet effect as I like to call it found on the areas directly close to the waterline Obviously, the exact same type of weathering techniques were done to the rear tail fin over here because obviously this would stick above the waterline. And if you look closely, you can see the weathering effects also present on this top portion of the tail that would receive quite a bit of extra sunlight. The remainder of the weathering on the superstructure was all done via the airbrush and was done with my usual techniques of counter shading as well as washing. I don't really use filters so much on submarines, but definitely you can see a little bit of the wash going on, which lightens up the color and that works well with the counter shading. For extra effects, I use a paintbrush and you'll see that with the various salt streaks and also rust streaks that are present on the upper extremities. And obviously on the exhaust manifold, you'll see several exhaust weathering effects added to this location over here, all done via the airbrush in the same method that I touch upon in my tank videos. The last thing I want to mention are the markings. For the USS Sculpin in this configuration here, it actually has the most amount of markings compared to some of the other Skipjack class subs I've built in the past. On this version, you'll see tower, or I should say sail numbers, right over here in the typical location. However, you'll also see that it has hull matching numbers right here on the front portion. This was seen on several other US submarines from this period, one notable example, of course, would be the USS Thresher. In addition to the numbers, you'll see the draft 
markings on this portion of the hull, which is a bit different compared to some of the other renditions of skipjacks I've done in the past, where they tend to be closer towards the center portion. Now, what's interesting is that in order to build the sub in this format, you don't have enough markings to do so, in that you don't have enough numbers because the kit only supplies you with three numbers for each boat. You have two for the sale and an extra, I guess, as a emergency case. So fortunately, because this is my fourth Mobius Skipjack kit, I have quite a few of these decals on hand. And because of that, I was able to fully mark the model in the configuration that we have here with the two markings on the sail and the corresponding matching numbers found on the bow portion. Of course, on the real portion of the sail, we have the name, U.S. Sculpin, right over there. And we also have some more draft numbers right here on the rear tail fin, which again is pretty much customary on all of these skipjack and U.S. attack subs in general. All of the markings are your standard water slide decals, and fortunately the markings that are supplied with the Mobius kit are excellent. They went on without any sort of problems, but more importantly, they sealed on very, very well with the VMS matte varnish. The entire submarine from bow to stern top to down was covered in the VMS matte varnish. Obviously it was applied with an airbrush and you're gonna use a decent amount on a vessel or a model of this size. By the way, fortunately VMS just released a larger bottle of their excellent varnish. So if you're working on larger models like this one here, or if you build a lot of models as I do, in most cases, you know, it's true for both occasions, the larger bottles are definitely gonna be handy. Having said that, I was able to varnish the entire model here without using the entire small bottle. So that is something to keep in mind, specifically if you're looking to, you know, pad out or if you're curious on exactly how many bottles you ever want to purchase from the vendor. Once the varnish is applied though, you can see that the decals are nice and flat and the color just looks so much more vibrant and polished compared to the way it looks previously before the varnish is applied. And of course, it wouldn't be one of my skipjack videos unless I did a nice family photo of all of the models that I currently have built in my collection. They are all in chronological order with the one all the way on the top there being USS Skipjack, USS Scamp, Scorpion, and then now the Sculpin. And rest assured, USS Shark and Snook are definitely in the wings. Also, with all of the models lined up, you really get to see just how much variation in paint and weathering schemes that you can incorporate on any of these skipjack models. And I think it's safe to say that the myth that nuclear submarines are boring with their paintwork and they all look alike has definitely been thrown out the window. Normally at this point in the video, I would go ahead and wrap it up by giving you a pretty thorough skill level and recommendation type speech. However, like I did with the unboxing portion, I've talked that topic to death in the previous three mile showcase videos on the other vessels that you see here on the table. So I'll just basically go over it briefly. For recommendations, obviously, I recommend this kit for anyone who's an avid fan of U.S. submarines, submarine models in general, and also if you're just a fan of the USS Skipjack, which obviously I've been becoming over the last year or so. The skill level on the model is actually one that is fairly easily assembled by most builders out there. Obviously, if you never touched a plastic model kit before, perhaps you want to pump your brakes, build a few other simple builds so you have the basic knowledge in just working with plastic models and more importantly, working with bodywork. Once you get seam removal down pat, one of these skipjack models become very, very easy and a very good contender to add to your collection. The submarine itself is RC capable in that you can convert the model to be radio controlled. However, it's not nearly as easy as one might imagine or is even the way it's advertised on the box. There are conversion sets out there and there are also several individuals on the internet as well as on YouTube that go into the actual conversion process in far more detail than I can possibly in this video. But if you're looking for a nice static large submarine model, you'd be hard pressed not to find a better and more affordable and readily available example other than the Mobius USS Skipjack kit. And with that, that wraps up this mile showcase video for the 172nd scale USS Sculpin SSN 590 Fast Attack Submarine. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posts of content being other Skipjack class Fast Attack Sub videos like the ones you see here on the table or my usual content which consists of smaller scale military vehicle models and larger scale one six scale military vehicle models and video updates. Another way to keep in loop and new post content is by liking us on Facebook 
where I have more photographs of all of the models you see here on the table, as well as the other builds that I added on the channel previously. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by Iron Bottom Sound Hobby Kits for the 172nd scale skipjack detail components that I mentioned in this video, as well as EastCoastArmory.com for 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one.